that was well discussed and we would now go on to Dr. Saurabh uh, Patwardhan and uh, who was really waited far too long and uh, thank you so much Dr. Saurabh and uh, 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 he definitely needs no introduction and he heads the Nandip uh, uh, Eye Hospital and has had so many fellows and so many uh, students coming out and the kind of YouTube presentations which he has. I think any of us at any age are still learning from him. So uh, kudos to you, Dr. Saurabh, and let's hear uh, your very interesting talk on the challenges uh, in a routine cataract surgery. And following this, the, since there has been so much of a change of sequences, Following this, it will be the unilateral cataract debate which will be taken up and then finally the fugues with early cataract. So, yes, on to you, yes. doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Chitra, madam, for this kind invitation and it's an honor to give this uh, keynote address. And uh, so far, we have been, uh, I think, seeing all the complexities of complex cases and my topic will be complexities in a routine cataract surgery. So it is going to be a little interesting. So when this topic was given to me, I was just thinking what exactly is mean by a routine cataract surgery. Now, we know what a routine is. A routine is a fixed or a regular way of doing things which is followed consistently over a time. Now, when we say it's a routine or regular cataract surgery, what we mean is that we are expecting very predictable steps and predictable results at the end of it. But sometimes I think the most complicated because we are doing a lot of routine cases as compared to complex cases. I think overall there will be more complexities associated in terms of numbers with routine cataract surgery than the complex surgeries itself. So just a clip to start, you know, we... All of us do this treadmill routinely, but sometimes the routine things becomes little complex when you approach things a uh, little differently. So the same routine surgery for us may become little complex if we approach things, you know, little differently. So we'll start with the uh, first uh, experience like uh, so this was a routine uh, surgical uh, you know cases because i always divide my surgical list into a routine cataract list and a complex one so so that i can give adequate time for complex surgeries uh, so this was part of routine uh, case list and i was doing and i heard a commotion outside in the preparation room where we had a patient who was uh, having a kind of a panic attack the reason was that patient had uh, intense claustrophobia. So patient was suffering from claustrophobia and that's the reason why he had delayed the surgery for low, so long because he knew that the drapes will be put on his uh, head and will be claustrophobic and already he was with that anticipation he was having panic attack. So I spoke with the patient, I told him, uh, because these are the cases, maybe I have to take him under general anesthesia or sedation or, you know, to relieve his anxiety. But uh, this was a routine cataract surgery. So I just spoke with the patient. I told him that we'll put the drapes, but your other eye will be always open. My assistant will be holding that drape, you know, up. And whenever you feel like, you know, look, looking around, you just tell me I will stop the surgery and you, you can look. Uh, through the, you know, the, once we lift the drape all, all around, you can just look around and see the assistant, you can speak with them, and then we can go ahead. And this simple step uh, relieved a uh, lot of his panic and he calmed down and he was extremely happy after, at the end of the surgery. So sometimes this kind of inc uh, incidences happen even with routine cataract lists and we may have to approach them differently. Now, though it is a routine cataract surgery, sometimes uh, we miss important history. So just showing one more, uh, you know, case here, actually, uh, the audio, I'm not sure whether it will be there or not. I was just uh, starting the case and the patient started talking with me saying that uh, this is my second eye surgery. So please do take care. Uh, now, uh, when uh, my assistant showed me the case sheet, there was no history of any previous surgery. So I asked her, uh, so it's, uh, it was like 35 to I think 37 year old lady. Uh, and she told that uh, she had uh, LASIK refractive surgery done few years back and she has not, uh, you know, told this to her in-laws and uh, that's why even in pre-operative examination she had hidden that. The keratometry was 3940, so probably that's why we missed it and we don't do topography as a routine for all our patients. Now, already I had planned EDOF uh, for this patient. Luckily, 
in this case i had a library so once she told me on table that she had undergone lasik so now uh, we uh, my, i asked my fellow to do the calculation with online calculator and barrett truke formula and find out what is the il power and luckily as i said i had uh, already the uh, uh, you know library of these lenses otherwise i would have, i was stuck uh, in this case so luckily everything went uh, uh, ahead smoothly but i think uh, missing a uh, you know important history because many times we may not ask or sometimes our assistants or optometrists miss taking a proper history during uh, their examination so that may lead to certain issues during routine cataract surgery now sometimes uh, we miss steps i'm just going to show you another uh, surgical case where uh, the surgery patient demanded uh, surgery under block so generally i do all my surgeries under topical anesthesia but uh, this patient specially demanded uh, when he came to the preparation room that uh, he wanted block so uh, my fellow gave the block and uh, after that the patient was immediately shifted to ot so you can see that as i started my capsular access immediately once i opened the main incision there was gush of viscoelastic outside and uh, that was because till the intra orbital pressure was quite high so normally we don't expect this this kind of uh, you know sudden up thrust uh, when when you are doing ccc but because it was a peribulbar anesthesia which was just recently given there was no no time was given it for it to dissipate no ocular massage was performed and straight away because my earlier surgery was already over patient was taken on table and draped and uh, this increase intra orbital pressure led to this kind of upthrust so all throughout the surgery there was considerable upthrust i managed it uh, later by using the small side port incision for doing the capsular access and all throughout i was little careful i gave more time for the case to complete but i think if we miss the step so the important message here i realize is that if the fellow or student has given block they should know that you have to give some ocular massage and wait for certain time before the patient is shifted for the surgery sometimes uh, when you are going ahead now this is another case which i would like to show uh, i was preparing to take the incision with the side port blade here and i was about to stabilize the globe and the moment i wanted to stabilize the globe the patient just in split second moved the eye away and uh, that led to you can see the blade is inside the cornea and just moved and created a very large uh, you know incision there so it was much larger than what i had uh, wanted obviously and once we have this kind of situation and this was just a routine cataract surgery but because of this large incision now i have to be extra careful all throughout the surgery now here we have to uh, you know have uh, think of options what can be done so uh, difficulties will be there will be leak expected and the re regular parameters will be risky so one option can be just suture the incision make a new small incision go ahead or we can do single handed phaco so that there is less leak around and uh, you can reduce the vacuum and flow rate so i go went ahead with single handed phaco so i tried to use just uh, main incision for most part of the surgery and only in uh, places where i needed the second incision i used it and whenever i was using second incision you can see that uh, there was a quite significant leak there from the side incision it was quite big side port incision but uh, by changing the parameters reducing the phaco parameters i could manage it uh, in this particular case but this was a regular case which turned out to be complex just because of that split second patient's eye movement where i had not stabilized the eye sometimes uh, we do things a little excessively uh, trying to make it safer but in land up with more problems so this is one of the uh, video from one of my colleague and uh, he is using the side incision for putting the ovd and he injected excessive ovd this was a heavy ovd so uh, difficult to wash out as well and with this kind of excess ovd you can see even the cornea becomes hazy as as well as the iris prolapse so you have to be very careful uh, simple excess ovd uh, makes uh, things little difficult and making it more complex another case i wanted to just uh, show here a uh, routine case and 
my one of my colleague decided to inject OVD, but he injected excess of OVD. So otherwise, the capsular excess was going fine, though it was a little bit on larger side. But the moment he started injecting the OVD and he excessively injected it, it caused deepening of the anterior chamber further. The zonules probably got stretched because of the, and probably the sclera was not that rigid, maybe a younger patient or a myo. And that led to just uh, tearing of this capsular axis away into the zonules. So just because uh, he tried to, you know, make it extremely safe by deepening the chamber, it in fact caused more problems. Now, another case where small capsular axis is done first, uh, Hydro dissection and then second in second hydro dissection, there was excess buildup of pressure in the posterior part. You can see that, and it just caused hydro rupture. You can see that in slow motion that the posterior capsule just ruptured, and this was a very typical pupillary snap sign which was seen. So otherwise, this was just a posterior subcapsular cataract, but hydro rupture resulted in impending nucleus drop, which had to be managed. So a pupillary snap sign in otherwise a regular or routine cataract surgery led to a complex situation which then had to be dealt with. Okay. This was another case from one of my colleagues, uh, completed the case and uh, IL was already implanted. It was a uh, just visco elastic has to be removed and see what was done. So while trying to go behind the IOL, the entire bag was pulled and caused iatrogenic dialysis. So this was just about to finish the case and caused iatrogenic dialysis. Though the IOL was stable in the bag, obviously with larger dialysis, there is always a chance that once the capsule starts fibrosing, the IOL may get uh, decentered. So colleague decided that I will put a CTR to stabilize the bag. I just wanted to show what things went wrong while putting the uh, CTR. So the first eyelet is already inside the bag. Now you have to press this CTR down so that it doesn't, you know, jump into the sulcus. But that's exactly what is happening here. These CTRs are very springy. So you have to guide them into the bag properly when you are using, uh, you are doing a manual injection of the CTR. Now using another grasper to push in the CTR, but the second hand, the Sinsky should have pulled the CTR inside and pushed it into the bag, but it was not guiding the CTR. And which means that now the CTR is going into the sulcus. You can see that, that at this point, the surgeon should have stopped, but continued and thought that might be able to put it in the bag, but ultimately lost control over the eyelet as well. And that uh, CTR went to the angle. Surgeon tried to retrieve it, but uh, now went into a little bit of panic mode because already there was one iatrogenic complication. So, and this happened. So he called uh, me and uh, I corrected it. So first thing was to get hold of this eyelet, which had gone into the angle. And with the forceps, I could, uh, you know, find out the eyelet here. And then I pulled out uh, the uh, CTR. You have to be very gradual in pulling this CTR out uh, so that you don't uh, damage the back further. And now I will guide the CTR again back into the back uh, by using proper technique of uh, CTR insertion. The anterior chamber was again inflated. And uh, now uh, the second hand Sinsky has to be properly used to dial it inside the back. So once first eyelid goes in, the second Sinsky should be uh, pulling it and it's better to use slightly longer Sinsky so that it doesn't uh, slip when you are putting the second eyelet inside. Now you can see how I'm guiding the CTR right into the bag and the position is now correct. It is guiding the CTR into the bag, avoiding it to jump out into the sulcus. And at, at the end, I'm using the grasping forceps to push it in and then use the Sinsky to hold the eyelet and then put it in the back wherever it is needed. So uh, it's important that uh, to avoid iatronic complication, obviously uh, the surgeon should have been more careful while going under the IOL. But if you have it, I think you, you should be able to manage it also well. Sometimes it happens uh, that uh, the surgery is about to end. You have done a good job and uh, just about to discover. So another colleague of mine doing the surgery, there was a small desmet probably detachment near the incision, which happens very commonly. But here the uh, surgeon withdrew the 
probe, IA probe, and what happened is that the irrigation started pushing this uh, decimates away, and at the same time, the IA probe held that decimate and caused a big tear. So you can see that. Now the surgeon tried to reflux, uh, push the reflux button and release that decimate membrane from the uh, IA probe, but it was not happening. Probably it, uh, the uh, the capsule had not completely occluded uh, the tip. So he had to slowly manually release this decimate. And of course, uh, we have to manage this by putting uh, air inside. And uh, But this was something which was uh, completely unnecessary just because at the end of the surgery, the surgeon was a little bit uh, not mindful of what was happening at the uh, incision site. And that, again, converted a routine regular cataract surgery into complex one. Uh, luckily, the tear could be managed just with air injection and patient did quite fine there. You can see the big tear there. So you have to be mindful, even if it is a routine cataract surgery, you might be doing lots of surgery in a day, but you have to mind, be mindful for each and every step. Now, uh, this is a case where the surgery has been completed. The pupil has come down a little bit during the procedure. It's a plate haptic trifocal aisle, which I have to uh, push inside the bag. Uh, I thought that I have pushed the aisle in the bag and started with viscoelastic removal OVD there. And uh, when I uh, removed OVD, I realized that the uh, aisle was not centered properly. It was decentered. Now, at this point, always you have to investigate why it is decentered. You should not just close the case at this point. So you have to think why this is not centered, whether it is in the bag or not, if the bag, bag is not stable or the, if the PC is not intact. You have to take care of that on table. Don't think that it will correct itself. So when I examine, I realized that the trailing haptics were not inserted into the bag while injecting properly. So uh, that's the reason why the aisle was decentered. Now, if I just close the case and, you know, the patient postoperatively is not going to be happy with the decentered aisle and I have to take the patient back into the uh, operating room and correct it. So it's always important before you close the case, make sure that aisle is in the bag and uh, there is no decentration of the aisle on table. Otherwise, you have to find out the reason and uh, make sure that it's corrected then and there. Okay, uh, Dr. Chitra, madam, do I have more time or should I finish here? I can't see. Hello? One minute left, sir. Hello? Uh, no, uh, doctor, if you have, uh, you are ready to conclude, then it's fine too, because we are running late, not because of you, but okay. because of the discussions. Okay, okay. I want a question or two to be asked to you. Okay, or... okay, fine. Then last video I will just keep. So that is yeah. the end of my... Well, wonderful, thank you truly thank wonderful you. set of videos it was and uh, dr uh, minu dr gaurav do you have a question to ask this very eminent surgeon you know he's already given all the answers he's beautifully demonstrated all the mistakes that can be done and then how to tackle them so i think uh, very nicely uh, managed and uh, you know, he's shown a gamut of uh, common complications that we can have. So I could relate to them because these are things that you can commonly do. Only thing was that the last one, the one which we just saw with the Desme, that was quite unique and, you know, it was scary as well. So I was just wondering in my mind, I was thinking what we could have done if reflux was not working because it's a very tricky situation and, uh, you know, there's little that you can do. It's almost like an aisle which is stuck in the cartridge and you want to, you know, kind of, you, neither can you go forward nor can you come out. And so, um, any thoughts? I mean, I don't have a clear answer. I mean, you did manage yeah. it quite well. So, but... what, what we did, like, this happened to one of my fellows, actually, when he was operating and he was, you know, stuck there, you know, sitting with the desmet in the IA probe and asking, what should I do? So, we pushed the reflex button, but as I said, probably the despite was not completely occluding the uh, IA tip. So that's why even if reflux was happening, it was not getting released. We tried even the pinching the uh, tube also. But ultimately, what he did was uh, with the left hand since he, because at this point, we cannot take or he has to manage it himself. So he slowly he could release that despite and luckily it was intact. So uh, that was fine. For us. So my thought was that if we just kind of disconnected the aspiration from the, you know, back end of the thing, somebody who was assisting you know, that would uh, probably, I mean, I'm not sure because the infusion. Yeah, actually it was, I think more because of the maybe capillary action that it had gone and because it's very thin. 
So it's like you know, got stuck there. So but, uh, but luckily, so nothing managed, happened. So we got yeah. away with it. But it looked very scary, and it's a good lesson that one. Yeah. Given. Another thing which I wanted to add here was that sometimes you know, if you are pushing, it happened to one of my consultants who was operating, and you know, in a glaucoma surgery from a side port. Uh, she pushed uh, towards the you know end of surgery. She was pushing from the side port uh, viscoelastic to form the chamber, and it caused a big DMD. Yeah. You know, yeah. it went across. And a whole inferior, uh, you know, temporal to inferior DMD. And then there was viscoelastic under the DM. It was crazy how to handle it. You know, we did like three attempts at kind of uh, doing it. So, I mean, sometimes you have to be very careful when pushing any fluid or viscoelastic from side ports that you, we end up trying to push it like almost like hydrating the wound. But one has to be very careful that you don't end up creating a DMD at that time as well. Actually, yeah, so I had one. Chair in the DM. I actually wondered how an air bubble alone sufficed. Maybe you could have needed a more long acting like a C3 FA. You know, yeah, because it was a superior, uh, basically the fellow was doing a superior incision. So the air uh, luckily was enough for this patient. Yes, Dr. Meena. Okay. Yeah, uh, Saurabh, as usual, uh, these are all uh, things which happen to all of us and you have rightly shown them how to manage and all those. So, uh, uh, what about uh, when you do cortex aspiration? I do. This is uh, things are which are happening to me also. So when you do cortex aspiration, and especially when this uh, seven millimeter, six millimeter pupils come down a little bit, and we have a tendency to go towards the equator and aspirate, and you maintain the uh, high high vacuum most of the many many years of the time, we don't go down much when you are uh, finding small bits and all there. Don't you uh, have you caught uh, uh, equator and pulled just like the one which was which is manually pulled by catching inside the the equator yeah so when you're aspirating a little bit of cortex here in the periphery yeah yes i think all of us have done that but i think one very good trick which probably i have seen dr vasavadas are doing i don't remember but i have in one of my videos i use generally coaxial ia and uh, when we are doing the cortex aspiration the trick not to hold the capsule is pull it posteriorly and not centripetally so if uh, you uh, it's only a small you know distance you travel with your probe but you don't pull it centripetally but pull it down so what it does is that it gives fluid a chance to go un underneath and the cortex get released and you are also away from the capsule so chances of catching hold of the capsule is quite less so i think that avoids whenever you are doing very fast cortex expression this is what i do so i hold the cortex and pull it down rather than centripetally in the second, one more thing is the as Gaurav was telling about the hydration of the paracentesis. Uh, sometimes when I do hydration, the uh, side port gets quite white, and then you don't know exactly where you are, and you see that it is leaking again. And if you hydrate again, you don't know where the location is. And I've had one or two uh, fluid waves going around partially. You know, suddenly when the fluid comes on, I stop. But then still, after it gets hydrated, and the second thing is uh, I have stopped. Uh, long back, when I was PG itself, I have had detachment by pushing visco from outside the paracentesis. So at that time itself, I stopped pushing visco from a large cannula by keeping it on the outer lip of a paracentesis. Without going into the anterior chamber, I do not do that at all. I think Dr. Narain has some question, Dr. Chitra. He was raising his hand. Yes, Dr. Narain. Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, just a small comment about actually the wonderful videos uh, as usual. Yeah. Um, uh, just a point on that, uh, you know, where the D uh, DM got uh, got stuck in the cannula. I think one simple tip is you, you remove uh, remove the tube and then even though the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the syringe doesn't fit into that hole, you, the assistant can just flush it al along that hole that some amount of fluid will, uh, you know, push out the DM that I think uh, would really help in such scenario. So nice. I think next time, next time if we <laughs> have this, <laughs> this was a unique situation. Luckily, the fellow held the probe just like that for at least for, for you know, few minutes till we try different things. Most of the times, you know, somebody will just pull it out and entire desmet is out with, <laughs> with yeah. that probe. Yeah. So luckily, can, he didn't uh, do that. can I ask a quick question, man? 30 seconds. Um, yeah, 30 seconds because we are really late. I have two seconds. Yeah, I'll finish in 10, ma'am, and uh, yes. leave the rest 20 to Saurabh yeah. to answer that. Yeah. Saurabh, one of your uh, wonderful videos, because I agree with all the panelists here, uh, one of your cases, uh, 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 side port extension inadvertently that was caused due to the patient time movement, and then you created the main incision again and largely did not use the large uh, side port incision. 
Could you have used the enlarged sideboard incision as the main incision and not construct another main incision at all uh, to complete the case and yet you use the more uh, bimanual technique? Maybe change the sleeve to a 2.81 just to fit into the extended uh, sideboard incision and use that as a main bone? Yeah, it was a quite old video, uh, but it was very large, almost uh, four millimeter large extension. So I could not use that. Uh, I thought of that at that point, but uh, it was, and it was also very short incision. So it would have leaked even uh, if I had used, but uh, yeah, if it is exactly 2.8, if I can, uh, you know, by mistake make it, then it was a good idea to use that. These accidental incisions are very shallow, so difficult. It wouldn't be a proper wound construction. Thank you very much, Dr. Saurabh. Uh, 